I've known Reverend Doug Dieter for 30 years. The thing that intrigued me so much about him, the more I learned of his background, is here he is, he was a man at Teen Challenge in New York City, serving under David Wilkerson, um, his personal chaplain, Leonard Ravenhill. I shouldn't say personal chaplain, the chaplain at Teen Challenge. Doug will correct me if I get anything wrong. So, um, but what would make a man leave what to many would seem like the pinnacle, the ultimate place to be, to go find more out about prayer and about life with Jesus? So, this evening you get a chance, you're going to have the opportunity to listen to Doug Dieter for 20 minutes, his book's on the table, um, but 20 minutes sharing from his heart um, about the Lord, and that's about it. I'm really lousy at introductions, Doug, I'm sorry. Good evening. God bless you. Pleasure to be here. And I wrote on my paper, this is a joyful evening, isn't it? The joy of the Lord is our strength. Amen? I thought I should give you just a tiny bit of background how I know Chaplain Ken. I knew him before he was a chaplain, of course. Um, it was back in the time when I was part of what was called the Zion Faith Homes, and the book you have on the table there, I wrote because I'm about the last one alive that could tell the story. But he used to stop by on his way to Trinity Seminary in Deerfield, Illinois, and Zion was on the way and I met him and I was teaching a class called What the Bible Teaches About Mercy, which you also have a copy of that on your table. Um, I grew up in a Christian home, but I didn't really know how to love people. And then I encountered this book that you have called What the Bible Teaches About Mercy. I read it through out loud twice on my knees. It took me a long time, but it changed my life. And I learned how to love people. And Chaplain Ken found out about my class and on the way to Trinity he would stop by and in the basement of the meeting room, meeting house, we had a class there for the students, and Ken became one of those students. And through the years, we've kept contact. And I eventually came down here to Colleen and uh, on KPLE TV, Chaplain Ken interviewed me, and I met Miss Catherine for the first time here. And uh, I just appreciate, Ken, you, your life, and the invitation you've given me to share tonight. I'm very grateful. I'm sure you've blessed me as much as I've blessed you. Now, I want to start my remarks by quoting from a somewhat famous verse from Psalm 68, 11. It reads in the King James, the Lord gave the word and great was the company of those that published it. You may have heard that uh, if you've listened to Handel's Oratorio, Messiah. It's one of the great choruses in that epic work. The Lord gave the word. 
<clears throat> but it's a famous verse for another reason. If you were to read that verse in the Hebrew language, you would discover that the word company is feminine. So that you can translate that, and it has been translated in the American Standard Version as well as the Amplified Version, <clears throat> not only in feminine but in present tense. The Lord gives the word, and great is the company of women who published it. I'm indebted to uh, the founder of what became Gordon Divinity School out on the East Coast, Dr. A.J. Gordon, Baptist minister. I'm indebted to his little pamphlet on the ministry of women for learning that little fact that I just shared with you. He, you forgive me if you're Baptist, but some of his Baptist brethren um, the Baptists, the American Baptists they were, not Southern Baptists, they had a great number of missionaries around the world that did everything that a minister did. But when they came to the missions convention in the States, they weren't allowed to say anything. And Dr. Gordon chided his peers by saying, but the Bible says great was the company of women that published the good news, so you should let them speak. <laughs> My point is this. Your Miss Catherine is an exact fulfillment of that prophecy. She's been publishing the good news, the word, for 30 years and broadcasting it. And I'm grateful that God gave me the privilege of meeting her, not only here, but with Chaplain Ken. I met her in Alaska. She came, and Sister Mitzi was there. Do you remember? You do. Good. I remember you. <clears throat> and also in India, Miss Catherine came to India. And she even came to Evergreen Center for one of our annual retreats. So I got to hear quite a bit from Miss Catherine how this station came into being. And you, most of you know that story. And it has been reviewed briefly here tonight. Wonderful story. This is an ironic aside, but let me throw it in here. It's still to the point. I also met another Miss Catherine who was greatly used of the Lord to publish the word, Catherine Kuhlman. I met her in 1975. She graciously had invited David Wilkerson to come once a month uh, to her meetings in Pittsburgh. And uh, then Leonard Ravenhill got to meet her and then I got to meet her in Israel in 1975 at the Second World Conference on the Holy Spirit, which I was privileged to attend, and we stayed in the same hotel. And I'll never forget when I passed Miss Catherine in the hall, she looked at me and she patted me. I don't know if any anointing went in that pat, I don't know. <laughs> but she patted me and I felt such compassion from that woman, whatever else you might think, that woman expressed compassion. And she was another fulfillment of that prophecy in Psalm 68, 11. Great was the company of women who published the word. Praise the Lord. Um, in any event, <clears throat> the question before us today is, well, let me, let me backtrack for a second. I actually heard Catherine Kuhlman say something that struck me deeply. Uh, she got a lot of criticism, you probably know that, and uh, partly for being a woman. 
But I heard her say to a group of pastors, all men, you know why the Lord raised me up? Because you men failed to step up to the plate. That was a very convicting word. I see most of the ladies are smiling. I think that's, that's good. God bless you all. We appreciate all you ladies. This is not a doctrinal point. I'm not trying to make any doctrinal point. Just saying the Lord has raised up at least two Catherines with worldwide effect. Anyway, the question in front of us today is, will we step up to the plate as the Lord transitions this ministry from Miss Catherine to others, including Brother Ken, the new general manager. To put it in Jesus' words and, and a different simile, will we put our hand to the plow and go forward for the kingdom? Will we do it? You're at a transition point. Are we going to let the vision die? Or are we going to carry it forward? And not only will we carry it forward, but will we expand the vision? Now, I want to share a personal testimony or two with you about how the Lord did that in my own life. As you would read in this book that's uh, on your table, and you're welcome to get more copies if need be, but <clears throat> I lived in the Zion Faith Homes for almost 30 years. I wanted to live there and die there. I never wanted to leave. Once I committed, it was such a wonderful place. It was heaven on earth to me. There was... The beauty of Psalm 133 was there. Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. And the last verse says, and there the Lord commanded the blessing, even life forevermore. I didn't want to leave. And yet, the Lord indicated I should leave. <laughs> I didn't want to. <laughs> These friends I just met today are laughing because they shared their testimony with me. God bless you. Another brother, Ken, and his wife's name is Sheila. Get acquainted with them. They're lovely people. <clears throat> and I thought... Do I really have to lift my eyes to a further horizon? There's a little door opening for me. Will I go through it? So it was a little difficult time, and for several years we didn't know, my wife and I, what are we going to do? And then a very, very tiny door opened. I can't give all the details. It'd take more than my 20 minutes. But a little door opened for me to go to India with a fellow minister. And I prayed and I prayed and I didn't know and I didn't get an answer and I didn't know yes, no, I was willing, but what do I do? And eventually the Lord just kind of quietly said to me, do you know that still small voice to you? He said to me, well, just go. And the mercy that I taught you to do here in the States, go do it in India and don't make a big deal of it. So, okay, I can do that. So I did. I had no idea how God would use that simple little step into the next thing, the expanded horizon, over the horizon, beyond the horizon, how God would use that. And 
10 years later, after several trips, not only to India, but to Myanmar, um, I had an inkling that I should write a book. And I didn't know, how would I do that? How would I get started? I, I don't know. I was a math major in college. <laughs> and I found myself wondering and praying and Pastor S.R. Manohar, who some of you know and who I think will soon be on the station regularly, one of the sort of giants of spiritual depth in India. I, I don't say that lightly. In fact, I have so much confidence in what the Lord has done in this man that I have asked him to preach my funeral whenever that is. He said to me, you need to go ahead and, and write a book. You need to do it. The story of the Zion Faith Homes needs to be told, but you need to include in it a mature and robust understanding of the coming of the Lord. Most people's understanding of the second return of Jesus is childish and immature. And God wants something more mature and more robust to come into the understanding of his people of what it means for Jesus to come back to this earth. It's a whole lot more than an escape hatch for Christians. So I was sitting in the breakfast room at a hotel in Bangalore and a, one of Brother Manohar's friends, businessmen, asked to see me. So I came down and had breakfast with him and he wanted to know how I was feeling and I shared with him a little bit about my desire to write a book. And he reached down in his satchel and he said, yeah, the Lord told me and he pulled out 100,000 rupees and handed it to me to get started. <laughs> mm, I think I better do this. <laughs> and I did, you have it. The Lord had made real to me some years ago from reading and studying the approach of the children of Israel to Canaan, the promised land, that as soon as the Lord said, it's time to leave Sinai and it's time to go into Canaan, literally, I'm not swearing, all hell broke loose. Moses failed and died. Yeah, he failed. Of course, you understand, law never goes into the promised land, only grace. But Mo he got there, 1,500 years later he got there, when he was on the Mount of Transfiguration. But he had to wait a little while to get there. <laughs> Moses failed. Aaron died. Balaam was used by the enemy. He never cursed Israel, but he taught Balak <clears throat> how to corrupt them. And thousands of people died. The different entities in the region refused to let Israel go through. Og, that enormous man, king of Bashan, had an iron bedstead. He was so big, opposed them. People attacked them, wanted to destroy them. Everything went wrong when they were just about to go into the promised land. And the Lord spoke to me, and I gave seven messages on this at home. I brought a few copies if somebody's interested in hearing them on MP3. I do have a few copies with me. But he said to me, that's the time. Just when all that opposition comes up, that's the time to trust God and go forward.
Now you know how I'm going to apply it, don't you? This has been a rough patch. It hasn't been easy. In a certain way of saying it, Moses, my servant, is dead. So I got a Joshua. So stop wringing your hands over what's going to happen. <laughs> I know what I'm doing. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. And I want to challenge you tonight. Put your hand to the plow and watch what God does. Quite providentially, the Lord has given you an opportunity to live stream, as you've heard. Roku is worldwide. Apple TV. Brothers and sisters, the sky is the limit. And you need to get behind it. I'm not a businessman, I'm a preacher, a pastor but I understand the importance of vision. Have you caught the vision? The next step is means. After you have the vision, you need the means. Are you going to help with the means? And the third thing you need is content. What the business world calls product. But you need content. And Chaplain Ken, I'm sorry, I always call him Chaplain. I've got to stop that after February comes and he's fully retired. <laughs> Brother Ken, he's got the vision and he's, got the, he's promoting the means, but he's got a vision for the content. He wants to put definite, spiritual, worthwhile content on your station. Will you let him do it? And it has to do with the Lord's second coming. I cannot tell you the depth in my own soul of the longing I have for Jesus to come. He's the the answer and we don't quite grasp it yet what it's going to mean for Jesus to come back Chaplain Ken wants to put that kind of content on this station will you back him I'm, I'm, I'm really not accustomed to speaking to banquets. This is new for me. But I believe 100% in the vision that God has given Miss Catherine and has transferred to Chaplain Kent. I believe in it with all my heart, or I wouldn't be here. There was another time in my life when I had to go beyond the horizon. It was when we decided to purchase 105 acres in central Wisconsin to start Evergreen Center. We had a congregation of about 30 people. <laughs> and a few months before we had to face this challenge, would we pay a half a million dollars for this property with a congregation of 30 people. <laughs> and my wife, my precious wife, who I wish she could be here with me, but she has contracted Alzheimer's disease and is unable to accompany anymore. But then, back then, she looked at me one day and she said, Doug, you know what? What? You need to add more zeros to your faith. <laughs> and she was right. 
Do you know it's no harder for the Lord to give somebody a hundred dollars as it is a thousand? The Lord told me recently, I never run out of money. <laughs> really? Yeah. I never run out of money. And then I had, am I over my 20 minutes? Forgive me for three minutes more. <laughs> okay. I, I had a, it wasn't a vision, but it was a sight. And I was praying, and I saw and heard but it wasn't a real vision. I'm just telling you, it just was kind of a reality to me. And I saw ministries all over the world. And they were all asking for one thing. Money. Every one of them. Oh God, if we only had more money, we could do so much more. Now, I'm not contradicting myself. I want you to understand something. And I said to the Lord, is this what you hear every day? And he said to me, yes. This is what I hear every day. Everybody all over the world, ministries, they want more money. And he said to me, do you remember when your daughter was young and on Monday she'd start in, Dad, after school on Friday, can we go to McDonald's? Well, yes, dear, of course. Tuesday, have you forgotten? I want to go to McDonald's on Friday. Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Finally, I said to her, you know, by you begging me like this, you make it sound like I'm so mean and so stingy, the only way you'll get me to take you to McDonald's is if you keep begging me. You won't even let me be nice. <laughs> I said, yes, Lord, I remember that. And the father said to me, I love to provide for my children, and I'm going to provide for all the ones that are asking me because I'm their father and I will gladly supply their need but I do hear this every day asking for money I said Lord somehow that that seems to me like we're a little bit you know, thinking you're stingy and you don't have much to give, you know, and you might just be persuaded to reach into your divine pocket and give us a little bit. What should I ask? What would please you that you would hear something different? And he said to me, ask me to keep you full of the Holy Ghost and fire. And he said, I will meet the need of all those that ask me, but it gives me greater pleasure to give you the Holy Spirit and then to just freely make sure you have all the money that you need because you don't treat me like I'm stingy. Well, we bought the property. And today we have about 75% equity in it already. Yeah. And I have a brother-in-law that's in real estate, and I invited him to come out when we first brought the property. He's from Boston, works with million dollar stuff. And he, I invited him to come out with an engineer, see what we could do with the property, and see whether he thought it was a good idea. And all of a sudden, as we were walking from one part of the building to the other, he stopped, and he's, he's tall, and he's Italian, and he looks like the godfather. <laughs> Doug, he says to me, 
God has given you a tremendous gift. Don't blow it. <laughs> I said, yes, Jim. I want to say that to you. God has given you a tremendous gift. Don't blow it. This is your moment and your hour. Will you cooperate with the distant goal that God has in mind so that you'll look back on this day and you'll say, you know, five years ago, we started in a new pathway to expand the horizon. We're so grateful for what Miss Catherine did. But now we've started on a new pathway. Do you want to be here at a banquet five years from now and see what God has done? Amen? That's my challenge to you. Can we pray? <clears throat> Father, I hope that you're pleased with what I said. I think you are, but you have the right to correct me anytime you want. But I, I trust that I've said something that was meaningful and helpful. And I do agree with all those that are in faith for what you want to do in this area and through the world, it really. The doors are open. And I agree with those that are taking faith. Enlargement doesn't happen by chance, does it, Father? It happens when we go forward by faith. So I ask that you'll grant that faith to complete what you want done through this station for the glory of God and for the preparation that's needed for Jesus to come back to a hearty welcome from his people. Thank you, in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.